Members, uh, members uh, today I received within the prescribed time a letter from the Leader of the Liberal Party in the following terms. Uh, matter of public interest, I wish to move the following as a matter of public interest today that this House condemns the Labor government's inability to acknowledge the ongoing and deeply devastating health crisis and its impacts upon, impacts upon West Australians. Uh, yours sincerely, uh, Dr David Honey, MLA, Leader of the WA Liberals. Uh, the matter appears to me to be in order, and if there are at least five members who will stand in support of the matter being discussed, and there are, um, the matter can proceed. Uh, the Leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, members? We sort of go back to last week and there wasn't a health crisis. The, sorry, Leader. I'll, I'll read the motion. I apologise. If you could move the motion, that I will. would be great. Thank you. I was almost off in flight there. Thank you very much for, right, thank you. for bringing me back to the important task of reading the actual motion. The motion is, Madam Speaker, um, that... The, that this House condemns the Labor government's inability to acknowledge the ongoing and deeply devastating health crisis and, it in, and its impacts on Western, upon so Western Australia. So you've moved that motion, yes? Thank you very much. Uh, now, um, as I say, isn't it interesting, members, you know, how things change in a week? They say a day is a long time in politics. Well, you know, a few days over the weekend is certainly a long time in politics because last week we didn't have a health crisis. Um, in this place, and then all of a sudden, over the weekend, we see $1.9 billion uh, mysteriously appear to be uh, to get out of the crisis. And I was pointing out last week when we discussed this, when we discussed this matter, that uh, it seemed that the Minister for Transport had the magic key when it came to getting money out of the Treasurer um, for the uh, enormous blowout in the Metronet project. And uh, you know, I did suggest that. Uh, Perhaps the Minister for Health could take some uh, hints, and, and obviously the Minister for Health has. I, I imagine he's gone and asked. I imagine, I imagine the Minister for Health has, has said, "Look, uh, Minister, look, Minister for Transport, what's the magic? Because I'm just not getting any traction to get the support I need." So, look, good on the Minister for Health. I think you know, admitting that it is a crisis and and putting your hand up and and seeking the uh, seeking the support from your uh, your colleagues um, for this is. A, is a good thing, and we welcome that recognition that this is a health crisis. Um, but the, the problem is the reason we're here, and, and I don't think we're going to see anything different going forward, to be quite frank, um, is the mismanagement of this portfolio under a part-time health minister. And I don't blame the minister for that, uh, in the sense that the Premier has given him a whole range of portfolios. And uh, we have said for some time that that is going to be uh, a real problem, because it's going to be very hard for this minister to focus on the matters that need being dealt with. And, and what we've seen is it's taken four and a half years for this government to recognise that there's a health crisis, despite on this side uh, us repeatedly telling the government there's a problem and that there are major problems uh, in the health system. Now, I would um, especially at this point like to recognise the excellent work done by the, uh, health, the, uh, the opposition's health spokesperson, Libby Metham, uh, and for all the work she and my parliamentary colleagues have been shining on this matter, um, and I hope that has actually given some assistance to the Minister for Health get his support because finally finally the Treasurer has realised, hang on, there is a crisis and of course it's a crisis that no one could ignore because everyone I speak to who goes to hospitals, everyone I speak to who goes into hospitals tells me about it. They tell me about the stress the staff are under, they tell me about the time they have to wait uh, to get ser uh, services and I'd also like to, to uh, thank the AMA and the Australian Nursing Federation. I assume they have the Minister on speed dial and their button's just about worn out. Um, because uh, they are doing the excellent job of representing our healthcare workers uh, in this state and making and, and recognising just the enormous mental stress and physical stress that those uh, members are under trying to provide the good service to the people of Western Australia. And sometimes the government tries to sort of make out uh, on this side that somehow we're critical of those healthcare workers. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, truth. We have deep empathy for what those healthcare workers are going through because of the inaction of this government. The, uh, if we uh, uh, look at the um, recognition, we look at the, you know, the, the sort of treating this health crisis as a political issue. So, so all of a sudden we hear that there's a great bucket of money. So we see the media statement, there's a $1.9 billion boost. Um, uh, then we're going to have 332 extra beds. 
um, uh, and so on. And, and I'll go through that. Uh, the 332 new beds comprising 223 general beds and 109 mental health beds and so on. And it goes on to talk about um, delivery of various uh, services and investments uh, in, in this particular area. Um, now, I want to go into that in a little bit uh, of detail because it sounds like um, there's a, a significant investment. Now, we don't know exactly how much of this is new funding because, like all announcements by this government in relation to funding, what we see is that it wraps in old commitments with new commitments and then it's all presented as a new commitment. So we're not actually sure whether it is $1.9 billion of additional funding or whether it's some new funding and old funding uh, wrapped in, but we've got a hint that a bit of it's old funding. Um, now, the, the, the media announcement exposes itself um, as smoke and mirrors. So if we look at the, the release, it says funding for 332 extra beds uh, and more frontline staff at WA hospitals. Now, you would assume, members, that that's 332 on top of whatever the government's already planned to do, 332 beds on top of what the government's already planned to do beds. So, you know, we would welcome that, those more beds. They're desperately needed. It's quite clear that the hospitals are massively overstretched. But what do we see? Um, uh, we, uh, uh, it goes through. So the government's announced that. Um, now, what do we actually see um, um, when we go into the detail? But in fact, it turns out that 158 of those beds have already been committed. 158 of those beds have already commi been committed. So this is an, an old announcement. So it's not 332 uh, uh, new beds. Uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, almost 160 beds uh, fewer than that. So it, it's not 332 new beds. So what, why spin it? Why not just say you're putting in this number of extra beds? Why go in there and spin it as if you're putting in 332 new beds on top of former commitments? Um, and that 1.9 billion is a new commitment because, as I say, if that money was well spent, we would say that's probably appropriate by this government. Um, but in fact, uh, it, it's an old announcement. Now, we also see that Labor's being um, deliberately opaque on the timing of the implementation of these measures. Now, we can't wait four years for this crisis to be solved. Um, we've seen that four, three to four per cent increase in demand for services year on year, uh, that, that uh, there seems to be some desire to deny that that's the case. Um, but we've seen that uh, going on and on. We need a solution now. We've got a system that is massively overstretched. Um, now, the ministers um, promised the uh, 1,000 nurses back in the 14th of April, and, and we see the announcement then back in the 14th of April, um, and, uh, uh, and it goes through and talks about the 1,000 new qualified nurses joining the health system uh, this year, and uh, the minister has outlined today, he says that the government is well on track uh, to do that. Interesting to see what the net increase is, but uh, the minister said again he's given a detailed press conference today uh, outlining all of that. So we'll look at that and just see what that represents in terms of, uh, in terms of increasing staff uh, into the hospital system. Um, but um, if, we, uh, if we go a little bit um, further down, it, it's talking about an extra 200 newly qualified nurses are in addition to the McGowan government's election commitment. So in April, um, it, it, we saw this announcement come out. At the election, the government said there was no problem, no health crisis. In April, they're already admitting that there's a crisis. Uh, and then we see, uh, coming up to now, the admission that, in fact, there's an even greater crisis, a $1.9 billion crisis uh, in the health system. Now, we've seen that, um, we've seen that uh, the minister has now said we're going to have an advertising blitz. So the, the minister stood up here and claimed that he's undertaking a national and international advertising blitz. Now, just like the broader health, uh, uh, health announcements, it's a campaign that sort of sounds very glitzy, uh, glitzy big on detail, uh, uh, big on promise, I should say, but extremely light on detail. Now, no one has seen the advertising blitz. Now, the ANF um, certainly are querying why they haven't seen it. If we're out there, we're advertising, we're fighting for nurses internationally, why haven't we seen that advertising blitz? But in fact, we haven't seen that advertising blitz. Now the um, uh, and we we see that the minister can't even tell us how many nurses have come in from overseas on this. Now, in our health system here, we know that the reality is. Let, let's take this back in a little bit of logic, members. We knew uh, a, a year ago that there were shortages in the hospitals. 
So when we talk about getting these extra nurses, the government couldn't even fill current vacancies. They couldn't even fill current vacancies uh, in the hospitals. Uh, and we know that the health system in Western Australia has always critically depended on a steady stream of doctors, nurses and other health professionals coming from overseas. Um, and yet, what we, the minister can't even tell us how many medical professions we're getting in from overseas. Now, we know it's a competition for talent, but the truth is Australia and Western Australia is a highly desirable location for people all over the world. So surely it can't be, on the wits, can't be beyond the wits of this government uh, to have already brought people in, and we should know what that is, because, to be quite frank, I believe that there have been efforts to do that, unsuccessful. I have no faith whatsoever that this minister is going to deliver in the future uh, in, terms of those, uh, in terms of those additional uh, recruitment exercises. We don't have the details. What country are we advertising in? How much money is being spent uh, in the campaign? How many nurses do we expect to recruit? So what's the target for overseas recruitment? Because we cannot fill all of those places. It's all right saying you're getting graduate nurses in, but you all know, or any one of you that have been involved in the health industry knows, that in fact graduate nurses in their first year or so consume resources at the hospital. One of the problems in the hospital has been that the staff in the hospital uh, are in fact have been taken off training uh, and because they can't afford the time to train the new uh, nursing staff that are coming into the hospital. So uh, those, ones are, those new nurses in the longer term will help. Maybe in four years they'll be extremely helpful in our medical system. But right now we need experienced additional nurses in the health system. Uh, and we're not seeing any detail on what those targets are. Um, we don't, uh, we don't and, and the Minister did give a little bit of detail today saying that they were going to bring in these nurses, they were going to be above the cap. I'm um, interested to know the details of that minister, and that is how many nurses are we going to bring in above the cap? I might say, just as a little aside on this, we heard on the weekend, any of you that watch Landline, the dire straits that farmers in this state are going to be in um, come the next harvest because they simply do not have the labour coming in. If it can be done for nurses, why can't this be done for other professions as well, other critical needs in this state? But that is a, an aside. Why can't we see that? But I'm glad to see that and I'm glad to see it's above the cap, Minister, because that certainly answered some questions that we had on this, uh, this side of the House. What are we going to do when we bring those nurses in? Where are they going to be housed? How are we going to have accommodation for them? Because we know the other thing we have in parallel with the health crisis in this state is a housing crisis in this state. And that is that when people are trying to get workers in, there's nowhere for them to live. So has the, has the health minister, I understand if you've got current people uh, living in the state, trainees coming up, but when we're bringing in new nurses and new doctors from overseas uh, and from interstate, do we have any plan whatsoever for housing them? Um, I know in regional communities they have not been able to get workers into those communities because they simply do not have anywhere for them to live. And can I say that includes police and nurses. In Geraldton, I understand um, that in fact the government's availing itself of Airbnb to try and house government workers. So that has to be dealt with uh, in parallel if we're going to see a real solution um, to this particular problem. I do want to go on to the issue of the nurses um, being used in the, the COVID vaccinations. Um, I uh, am stunned by the Minister's question today uh, on that. Um, I, I know that there are a number of members in this place that actually do care about mental health is issues in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this community. But what we heard was is that we've seen in about a year a trebling of the most severe presentations uh, in schools uh, for students suffering mental health problems. And can I say that overwhelmingly uh, young women um, uh, are affected about twice the rate as, uh, of young men. And any of you that have been to the schools will know that self-harm um, is one of the major factors uh, that presents itself uh, in, in terms of a response to those mental health issues with those students. How can you take a school nurse out of the school? Because the school nurses are the ones that see those students. The school nurses are the ones that see those students with injuries. The school nurses are the ones um, who are going to be the canary in the cage reporting that issue and dealing with that issue. Those nurses are not just some ancillary. It's not just the school psychologist or the school counsellor or the school chaplain. They may deal with part of it. But in fact, it's the school nurses, those highly trained medical professions that identify 
identify those key issues and then can refer those students. I find it, I really do find it incomprehensible, given offensive. the enormous, it, it is offensive, given the enormous crisis we have in schools right across this state. We can all hypothesise about what we think the cause is, whether we think it's COVID or whether we think it's something else. But those frontline staff that are dealing um, with those students, the front line of dealing with the mental health of those students, um, that this minister would think, no, no, we'll pull them out. Our solution is to pull them out of the schools uh, and 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 put them into the into the into the COVID vaccination centres. Now, the truth is, if you want a priority, that mental health crisis is today. Today, today, there are kids in those schools who are suffering this enormous anguish and, and undertaking self harm. They need treatment today. Yes, we think you should accelerate the, the, the uh, vaccination program. I'd, I'd be very, very surprised if other states have pulled their nurses out of schools. And Western Australia is an absolute laggard in vaccinations. Uh, I think that, that this is a, should be a matter of shame for this government. And as I say, I was shocked by the answer um, that the health minister gave today in question time. Thank you, member. Uh, Deputy Leader of the Opposition. This excellent motion brought to the House by the Leader of the Liberal Party uh, and a call on the House to recognise the Labor government's inability to acknowledge the ongoing and deeply devastating health crisis. And nowhere is that health crisis more evident than in we see the uh, level of ambulance uh, ramping in our hospital system. It's emblematic of the, uh, of the entire crisis and we're up to 5,000 hours in, in a month of ramping is, uh, is a shocking uh, number and a shocking statistic to see. We know that the, uh, the minister has uh, responded to this through, uh, uh, through the, uh, the member of uh, the other place who's brought about the inquiry into St John Ambulance. Uh, now, instead of actually looking at the reasons for the ambulance ramping, it appears that Labor wants to have a go at St John's themselves. Uh, we've raised this as a matter of concern before because we know how important St John Ambulance is to the community that we represent uh, right throughout Western Australia, uh, both within the city and within the country areas. Everybody knows that the issue of ambulance ramping is not down to St John's, it's a mismanagement of the health system. But instead we see this misguided approach by the Minister to ensure that St John's themselves come under some sort of a review uh, led by the Public Administrations Committee under the Honourable Pierre Yang. You really think this was so bizarre and so uh, abnormal if it hadn't actually already happened before in the past. Now we know that uh, back in 2000 and, uh, and eight, uh, this report from the ABC. Opposition wants to retain St John. Well, the opposition then were Liberal National uh, members, and they were looking to stop uh, St John's being stripped out because uh, the Australian Liquor, Hospitality and Miscellaneous Union were quite happy to see uh, the government uh, looking at the situation with St John's. They were urging uh, back in 2008 for St John's to be taken over by, uh, that service to be taken over by the government. And in fact, the opposition's health spokesperson uh, then, Kim Haynes, said the proposal had not worked in other states and should not be introduced in Western Australia. Uh, and he goes on to say that uh, his understanding is that being far less than successful in other states uh, ended up with services that were less efficient than we already had. He's concerned that any change would result in less efficient and more expensive service. The problem is not St John's ambulance service, but Jim McGinty and his mismanagement of emergency departments, so that ambulances are ramped for hours at a time. Well, that was said long before we saw 5,000 hours of ramping that we see at the moment. But we know that attacking St John's uh, seems to be in the DNA of this party, just as uh, we know that attacking uh, electoral representation uh, for regional people is in the DNA of this party. And similarly, uh, we see a process now being launched uh, for uh, reform in that area, uh, even though there isn't a problem to be addressed in terms of a, of a misallocation of uh, representation between the city and the bush. Uh, the government's doing its best to make a problem, uh, to publicise that there is a problem, and then go out there and find its own solution, which was its existing policy before the election, just as it's doing with St John's here. A long-held desire, apparently, from the union movement uh, to see St John's uh, nationalised uh, may well come to fruition as part of this, uh, uh, this review and the, under the, uh, the overwhelming the overwhelming uh, majority that this government has in, uh, in both Houses of Parliament, allowing it to achieve that long-held uh, long uh, desire uh, to rid itself of, uh, 
of regional members of uh, parliament and to rid itself of St John Ambulance. Uh, it's a disgrace that it's even been contemplated at a time when we have already got a crisis in our health system. I want to turn very quickly to uh, another matter, um, and that is the breach of uh, protocol that took place on uh, two vessels uh, recently, the first one being uh, in Geraldton, uh, where a person had uh, COVID uh, and was taken to the Geraldton Hospital. We have spoken before about the series of events that led to alarm and concern in the Geraldton community, uh, and that there had subsequently been a uh, report done. Uh, last week in uh, private members' business, uh, we had a motion uh, on the health situation, and I asked then for the health minister and his response to that uh, to that uh, to that motion, uh, if he would uh, outline to us when that report would be made available, uh, and, uh, and when it would be completed, in fact, and when it would be made available, so that we could all see what actually went wrong uh, when that whole. Uh, uh, hospital was badly impacted and 50 odd people had to be uh, put into uh, a level of isolation for some time, uh, a great deal of concern in the community and then we found only a few weeks later exactly the same thing happening in uh, Fiona Stanley. Uh, and instead of getting an answer from the Minister uh, as to why um, we had not seen that report and when we would see that report, if we would see that report, uh, no answer was given because the Minister failed to respond to the motion. He sat there throughout the whole motion, he took notes, and then he set a whole coterie of backbenchers to stand up and talk about unrelated matters. I'm sure that they had very interesting topics, so very interesting things they wanted to talk about, but none of it was actually responding to the very uh, uh, cogent arguments put by the uh, opposition. Uh, and instead of that, we saw a minister who chose to hide behind his backbench. And I thought that was uh, quite unprecedented. I've never seen that before, where uh, you sit here, usually the minister sits through the uh, the, um, the outlined the case that the, the opposition puts forward and the minister chooses to respond. We now come to the point where the minister doesn't even respond. He just sits there and lets others stand up for him and, uh, and, take, and make the response instead of himself. I, I think that's disgraceful and uh, I asked some very relevant questions about Geraldton. I asked questions about the situation for regional people who are, um, are looking for their second dose of a vaccine and then find that their local health centre has cancelled the appointments. Now we know that there is a certain degree of time uh, critical uh, criticality around getting a, the appropriate uh, time to get your uh, your dose uh, for that second jab. And so, in some circumstances, I've been made aware that they've actually had to drive to Perth uh, several hours of travel um, to ensure that they can actually get the jab at the appropriate time. I asked the minister uh, about that, and again, there was no response. He just sat there and refused to respond. And, uh, and so we're none the wiser uh, as to, uh, to any of those issues. What happened in Geraldton? Uh, and why is that so important? Well, not only because it threatens the health of the staff in the hospital, not only because it threatens the health of the community in the, in the city of Geraldton and in the case of Fiona Stanley in the, uh, in the uh, wider metropolitan area here, uh, but it also threatens uh, the, um, the commerce between our state uh, and the rest of the world. And we've since seen uh, this government put out a notice to uh, shippers uh, about a range of procedures that they uh, expect uh, from what are known as uh, uh, high-risk ports or high-risk countries. Uh, and, uh, and the response from the government is actually, in a way, threatening the trade uh, of it, on which we all rely. And, uh, and it's led to a knee-jerk reaction last week of an announcement uh, for a particular country, Indonesia, of, of $2 million in assistance. Because I think you know that you went too far uh, and that you were actually uh, damaging uh, the trade of our country going forward uh, because of your inability to handle a couple of cases of COVID which had appeared uh, in the ports. I'm told by shippers that you can have plenty of um, processes put in place where there is zero contact uh, between the, uh, the ship uh, and any persons uh, that would lead to any risk of, uh, of COVID coming to the community. Instead of um, looking at your protocols, instead of looking at your failings, you've chosen to blame the shippers and to try to uh, put the, uh, the heat back on an industry which is already struggling to get uh, vessels over here uh, because there is a shortage of shipping right around the world. And, uh, and if you have a government which is uh, not clear about how it's going to treat uh, industry and treat those ships when they come here, they'll choose to go elsewhere and we won't be able to get our product uh, overseas. And then we'll see uh, that the, uh, the government's failings have gone far beyond uh, simply their inability to run a health system.
Thank you, Member. Deputy Speaker. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, I rise to support this uh, very good motion moved by the Leader of the Liberal Party. Uh, and I do, hope that the, I do hope that the Minister is going to stand and respond today because, as the Deputy Leader of the Opposition has pointed out, it was quite extraordinary last week where we brought a debate of quite uh, significant issues in relation to the state of our health system, and the Minister did not choose to stand. Now, that's either arrogance or is uh, simply had no answers, and, and what, we've, uh, what we've discovered is that he was waiting, I suspect, for a good news, a good news opportunity. Uh, and over the weekend, we've seen. We've seen a big headline. We've seen some dollars, some much, need, much needed dollars put back into the health system. But it's, it's uh, almost too little too late, Minister, almost too little too late. You are now mopping up four and a half years of neglect. Four and a half years of neglect. So I truly hope that you're going to stand up and respond to this debate and not avoid uh, some of those questions. Because like the Deputy Leader of Opposition, I asked questions last week during that debate around recruitment, which we asked again today. Uh, we asked questions around how they were going to be recruited, where they were going to be recruited from in terms of nurses uh, and other staff. And there were no answers provided because you didn't stand up. You didn't stand up and answer those questions, as you have a responsibility to do as the Minister for Health. So for months and months, this government has been blaming the influx of people going through our ED doors for the, the crisis that we see happening in our, uh, in our health system. But the figures don't lie. And uh, I, I would suggest neither does the AMA president of Western Australia, the Australian Medical Association. Now, he was on record yesterday as saying absolutely no massive increase in demand on the health system. The figures that we uh, are referring to come directly from the Department of Health in, re in reference to uh, those uh, people walking through the uh, emergency department. There has been a steady increase of 3 to 4 per cent year on year in, in ED presentations, mental health presentations, uh, 3 per cent increase over four years. Ramping has gone up 300 per cent. Now that is a summary of the commentary that the AMA President of Western Australia gave yesterday in response to uh, the information that was provided around the, the funding announcement from the government. The bit that goes to the heart of what we as the opposition have been raising in this House every day the Parliament sits is this comment. Neglect and underfunding by ALP, the Australian Labor Party state government, is to blame. They are to blame. Yeah. They are to blame. So they can deflect as much as they like, but all the key stakeholders in this industry, all the key people that are impacted, are suggesting that the reason that we have this rescue package on, on, on the deck right now is because this government has failed the people of Western Australia for the last four and a half years. This minister has been asleep at the wheel. Asleep at the wheel. Uh, he, goes on, he went on to make some other comments around WA, the only workforce without job security for senior doctors, and suggested that there wasn't a possibility of getting 100 more doctors if they didn't have job security. He mentioned that there was a severe shortage of child psychiatrists in particular, and I'd be very interested from the Minister's perspective as to how we will uh, address those issues, given the increase or the, uh, the suggestion that there has been a significant increase in mental health presentations. And, uh, and I think, uh, to go back a little bit, and talk about some of the, uh, the presentations over the last six months into our emergency departments. Uh, average presentations over the last six months of 2019, pre-COVID, uh, Pre-COVID, Deputy Speaker, 80,400 people. Average presentations the first six months of 2021, uh, 81,200. 81,200. It's not a significant difference. And the graph that we've got shows that they are they have been increasing in a predictable manner, a predictable manner that should have been able to be planned for by this government. So great to have the big announcement, extra funding and services, but the devil will be in the detail. The devil will be in the detail. And where exactly are they going to get them from? And when can we? expect them on our doorstep. I don't think the AMA believes you can do it. I know the Nurses Federation have serious concerns about how you're going to achieve that outcome, and certainly the opposition hasn't heard any detail today that gives us confidence we're going to see any uh, end to the crisis that we're experiencing uh, uh, today and into the near future. Now, in particular, midwives have been a significant problem, and we've seen, I think the numbers are, let me go, 40, a loss of 40 midwives over the, last four, uh, over the past year. We had 1,191 midwives in the first quarter of 2020-21 and just 1,151 in the last quarter to June. 
Now, with 6,200 bubs forecast for delivery at Kate, uh, King Edward Memorial Hospital alone, that's up from 5,800 in 2020, that is of serious concern. And the Minister will remember that uh, from a regional perspective, we raised quite some time ago, uh, 2019 I think, uh, some innovative solutions from the Geraldton University Centre, some other industry-led uh, solutions to try and get more midwives into Western Australia, and the Minister couldn't make it happen. There was no will. There was no will. So those red flags that the opposition keeps talking about, those code yellows, those ramping figures that have been occurring for the last four years, uh, the solutions that have been put forward by industry to train more staff, all being left to the last minute so that this government can sail in and provide a big chunk of money with no detail, it's absolutely not good enough. Failing the people of Western Australia, failing the people that are working in that system, and uh, I can I can absolutely guarantee, absolutely guarantee that the words of the Australian Medical Association's uh, president, uh, Mr. Mark Duncan, that the neglect and underfunding comes from the Australian Labor Party state government is to blame. They are to blame. Nothing to do with the people coming through our emergency department. Cannot deflect to COVID. It is simply not true. And I hope the minister stands up. I hope the minister stands up. In this debate and provides a response. Thank you, thank you, Acting Speaker. Well, my friend, you're no chip off the block, I can tell you that much. If I could be compared to Jim McGinty, I certainly wouldn't compare you to the Honourable Nick Catania. <laughs> You are a disgrace to the name Catania. You really are. And I must, I must think at times that your family watches your political career and just shakes their head in disappointment, betraying such a great family name with such a disreputable uh, act of conduct. Oh, I'm coming to you, Sunshine. Don't you worry about that. There is, there is no point of order. Carry on, uh, carry on Minister. Well, and Member Farrar, I didn't get up last time because you ran an MPI last week where you had the same arguments you ran today. Then you ran the same arguments for three hours during private members' business. And so what did I do? I referred you back to my arguments in the MPI last week. I mean, quite, and, and quite frankly, um, I, th I think the other members of parliament had your measure anyway. Had your measure. Members. Uh, I think the member for Coburn uh, mopped the floor with, with, with your arguments, and it was, um, it was a delight to see. Um, and, uh, but we will, we will entertain the same arguments that you put up. Uh, Leader of the Opposition, you come in this place uh, uh, peddling the same Liberal Party lies about the ED presentations, and, um, and that's disappointing. I thought, I thought you would do... I thought you would do your own your own homework, and um, and and I address that specific issue today in question time, and this is in part, acting speaker, uh, the frustrations that we have, and that um, we have said in this place on numerous occasions that there is a change in the way people are presenting to the EDs. They are presenting with greater acuity, and as, and they're presenting with more complex mental health issues. And I hear the man before uh, Cotterflo sighing, uh, which means that he's obviously listening to me. So maybe just for once this will sink in. Maybe this just for once will sink in. And that the fact of the matter is that, um, that we have had a significant increase in the uh, acuity of patients coming to, um, to our hospital EDs. Uh, a 10% increase in triage one, 15% increase in triage two. Uh, the, and they're the people who are having a significant impact in terms of our, in terms of uh, the the, uh, the the EDs at the moment. But this is this isn't you know we're not all we're not orphans in this. We're not orphans in this. This is taking place right around Western Australia. I saw an interesting article in South Australia the other day where they um, where the paramedics there are putting people into taxis and sending them to GP clinics so that they don't go to the EDs. So such is the such is the the state of the pressure that they are under, uh, the, the, and you know this is um, this is being replicated elsewhere. What they not doing elsewhere is responding in the same way that the McGowan government is, which is being able to oversee significant investment, uh, uh, significant investment in in their hospital system. 
And, um, and, and, this, and this is the reason why we say that the West Australian community should have confidence, and it's because they, they understand that we have a plan, a plan to increase supply and make sure that we can continue to, um, to invest in great health services so that we can continue to make sure that we provide world-class health care. The $1.9 billion that we announced the other day, uh, with the Premier announced the other day, uh, Acting Speaker, was a budget announcement. And yes, it does include the announcement that's already made, but that's the nature of budgets. They are a, it is a budget announcement. So it's a 332 bed increase. Um, and if uh, the member for Cottesloe had bothered Acting Speaker to read the press release, it says the 332 new beds comprise 20, 223 general beds, 109 mental health beds, with the budget including funding for 158 beds already announced. So we've been completely upfront. Page one of the press release, a public document, and one that we would hope the member for, for Cottesloe would read. We don't expect him to understand it. But we do expect him to read it, particularly if he's going to come into this place with the accusations that he's making. And um, I think it's important that members do, uh, that the community does understand the unprecedented level of investment that's going to our health system to make sure that we can respond to the current situation. And respond we are. I followed up with an announcement yesterday, um, Acting Speaker, that we are uh, obviously in significantly increasing the support that we are providing to, um, uh, to our uh, EDs, which, is, which includes a $50 million package to make sure that staff in our EDs have the support they need, which includes an investment around 50 new staff as part of the, uh, of the significant announcements we made at PCH, as well as funding for the virtual emergency management uh, program, which, is a, which provides an opportunity for, uh, for uh, paramedics to liaise with, with ED consultants to ensure that that, per that particular patient uh, ne necessarily comes to the ED. They may be diverted to an ambulatory care uh, facility. They may be diverted to a diagnostic or, or, or medical imaging facility. They may be referred directly to an inpatient facility. But this is what we do to continue to make sure that we manage the system in a dynamic way. And the member for Moore seems to think that we have some sort of uh, conspiracy uh, going on with regards to the tax to St John's Ambulance. I spent some, and, um, uh, and of course the CEO of St John's Ambulance was there with us yesterday to talk about the great partnership between the, the Gowan Labor government and St John's Ambulance. And it's, an, it's a relationship which continues to grow both through our great work that we're doing with innovations in metropolitan ambulance services, but also through our country ambulance strategy, which will see a significant increase in the number of professional community uh, paramedics as part of our, I think it is uh, a 30, no, I won't, I won't uh, mislead the House um, Acting Speaker with the number, but a significant increase in the number of professional paramedics practising in regional Western Australia. What is, what, are you some sort of ambassador for the HR Nichols Society? <laughs> really, member for Rowe. I mean, you can't say that the unions are taking over the ambulance service because their union members are already in the ambulance service. That's why they have an interest. That's why the same reason why the AMA, the doctors' union, has an interest in public health, because their members are there. The same reason why the nurses' union are interested in the public health system, because the nurse, their nurses' members are there. I'm not quite sure why you think there's some sort of takeover, but they're already in the actual ambulance services and are keen to see those ambulance services thrive like any other union does that's involved in the public, in, in the public health system. Madam Speaker, we made some significant announcements this morning with regards to, um, to recruitment of, of nurses. Uh, that, that involves uh, both uh, celebrating the fact that we've recruited 750 new uh, new experienced nurses either into or back into the into the hospital system that we've already recruited 927 nurse graduates as part of our 1100 uh, uh, graduate nurse intake that we will that we will uh, undertake this week this year 
and as part of a program where we are seeking to try to recruit doctors and nurses from overseas. It hasn't started today because of the announcement. Today was another budget announcement, so we, this, it will be funded. It's been part of a program that's been ongoing. Member for, for, for Swan Hills, this is, this is getting really loud and difficult to compete against you. <laughs> but, um, Hang on, Minister. Members down the back, if you want to have a conversation, take it outside, thanks. <laughs> Carry on, Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Acting Speaker. Uh, but it is part of an ongoing recruitment program to make sure we've got quality doctors and nurses standing next to the patients, uh, particularly in the beds that we are expanding. So that includes, Acting Speaker, uh, 209 doctors that we've already secured the services of and are making their way to Western Australia right now and in the coming weeks to come and practise their craft in our hospitals to provide great care. Now, usually these, these doctors and nurses would come to Western Australia automatically, Acting Speaker, as part of you know, UK and Irish uh, doctors and nurses, Indian doctors and nurses wanting to come to Western Australia as part of their experience, uh, uh, their professional experience. And they will continue to, um, but, uh, but because the borders are closed, we actually have to actively recruit and bring them into, uh, into Western Australia over and above the cap of, of, of returning Western Australians at any rate. So an important part of, of the program. And today we announced that we will pay for their hotel quarantine. We will also provide them with a relocation allowance because we want to make sure we bring them on board. In addition to that, we have refresher courses so that, so that nurses who are currently registered as nurses but have been some time before they've been in the, in the wards acting speaker will be able to undertake an online Line refresher course, which we will pay for, and then we will place them in a hospital as part of the completion of that refresher course in, in, paid, in paid employment. So a range, of, a range of measures that we are undertaking to make sure that we can meet the current spike of, of hospital demand. And I'm sorry if the statistics don't meet the opposition's narrative. Um, it's just unfortunate, but the fact of the matter remains that we are seeing a significant pressure on our hospitals. It's not because of a lack of resources. As I've already explained to this place on a number of occasions, we've increased hospital funding by 14 per cent in the time, since the time we've been in office. We had 34,700, uh, uh, I think it's 34,700 uh, uh, healthcare uh, health workers in Western Australia. That that figure is now at over 39,000. So you've seen a significant increase in the um, in the the resources to the hospital system. Again, doesn't meet the um, the AMA's or the um, opposition's narrative, but it's the fact. I want to turn. Um, momentarily um, acting speaker to the issues raised by the member for Roe in question time and re-prosecuted as, as part of their debate today. Uh, School-based nurses do not undertake mental health care of, of, of kids. They might have referrals, they might, um, they might, be, uh, they might be, have those issues raised with them, but they would then refer them to a school psychologist. And, uh, and I'm very proud of our election commitment, which we are currently uh, implementing, which is bringing an extra 100 school-based nurses into our education system. A great initiative, which will continue to make sure schools are a safe place for kids to come and to make sure that they can, get the, they can um, be cared for in that environment. Uh, in relation to the issues raised by the member for more, uh, the, there is an inquiry, a review in relation to the issues that took place at Geraldton Hospital. I think my response to you last week is the same as this week, is that you should put that question on notice. But, um, but, uh, but you know, when those, that information becomes available and um, the government's in a position to respond, I'm sure that that, that will be undertaken. But I think the premise of the member for more's uh, um, comments were that we've done a bad job managing COVID, that somehow Western Australia hasn't managed the, the COVID threat very well. And I think the, dominate, the dominating narrative member for, for more is the precise antithesis of what you're trying to suggest. And that even though uh, no system is perfect in, re, in relation to managing COVID, I think we've done a pretty good job. The people of Western Australia have been outstanding in relation to their response to COVID-19. And um, the Premier and I have been uh, fortunate enough to have the support of the people of Western Australia to provide to, um, to have actually guided us through it. Not perfect, 
Nothing's perfect. Nothing in healthcare is perfect. What is important is that you learn from the experiences of any clinical, any clinical situation and make sure that you continue to improve it. And, and we are. But, your, but this argument that somehow the whole system is broken because of one incident is, is just disgraceful, um, but is not unsurprising. We've seen the dangerous commentary today from Clive Palmer that vaccines are a, are a threat. And we know that Clive Palmer and, and we know that Clive Palmer is your friend. We know you jumped into bed with Clive Palmer as quickly as possible last year to undermine our strategies. We know that you're there. You're simply that you're that you're that you quietly enjoy Clive Palmer's narrative and Clive Palmer's efforts. Members. I tell you what's offensive, the member for Cottesloe, is the way that you scampered behind his coattails last year to try to tear down our borders. I tell you what is offensive, member for Cottesloe. Member for Cottesloe. It's you suggesting, it's you continuing, continuing to try to detract from our great efforts to to get rid of the COVID, to to respond to COVID-19 pandemic. But member for Cottesloe, I think the most damning effort of you over the last 72 hours has been your tweeting your little activity on Twitter to suggest that we haven't recruited as part of our 1,000 1, nurse graduate intake. And I'm very proud to say today that stands at 927. 927, and by the end of this month, will be 949 out of those 1,100. Now, I'm, I'm disappointed that you didn't take the opportunity today, when you were on your feet, to apologise to the chamber and to the government for trying to mislead the public. I'm sorry that you didn't, that you weren't, uh, you weren't uh, uh, respectful enough to the people that you represent to say to them, "I got it wrong." But it's not surprising. It's not surprising. It's what we expect from you. And uh, once again, with this motion, you've got it wrong again. Thank you, Minister. Uh, the member for Coburn, Deputy Speaker. Um, imagine this. Imagine being an opposition so hopeless at their job that they choose to use their MPI to give the government an opportunity to speak about their $1.9 billion investment in our health system. But we don't need to imagine that. We don't need to imagine that, Deputy Speaker, because it's happening Neighbours. right now. It's happening right now. Inconceivable. But, th but this is just a continuation of the brilliant strategy from the member for Cottesloe that he's been rolling out in this place time and time again. But that's all Neighbours. right. I'll get my mop out as the minister. Minister for Health said, and I'll follow his very good work. And I, I, I can talk about um, the additional $1.9 billion uh, that this Labor government is investing in our health system. And you, you, can, you can sort of see how we arrive at today's MPI by the opposition's performance in question time. Because you, you can sort of see that there was, there was probably a, a staffer who wrote this MPI on Friday afternoon, and, 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 he, and, he, and, and, and he or she left it on the desk of the member for Cottesloe, and, and he, he, he walked in this morning having swanned around Cottesloe all weekend, uh, and he's wandered back in this morning, and he, he picks this thing up on his desk. He goes, oh, this looks good. Yeah, this looks good. I'll put this in. Completely oblivious, seemingly, to the fact that in the interim, the government has made a very significant announcement about funding for our health system. And, and it, was, it, was, it was good to hear the member for Cottesloe acknowledge that in his contribution to this place, because otherwise you would have no idea that he was aware of it. Bringing this motion, I even went and looked on the member for Cottesloe's Facebook page. He's got about 1.4 thousand followers, which is about the same as me, um, having been in this place for a matter of months. Uh, and on his Facebook page, he, 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 he shared an article six hours ago uh, about the health system in WA Today, but the article was from the 5th of August. Uh, so it wasn't contemporaneous, didn't have anything to do with the significant announcements that this government has made in, in the health space. But, but look, that does expose a crisis in Western Australia, uh, Deputy Speaker. It, it exposes the crisis in the Liberal Party, the crisis that is engulfing the, the crisis. That, and he always, he goes, I know I've got him. I know I've got him. I can just sort of reel him in because 
leader of the Liberal this Party. Because this is the crisis that he is presiding over. A Liberal Party leader that is Liberal not Party. a serious opposition in this Members. place. And, and you know what I will say? Who am I, who am I, Member for Cottesloe, to look a gift horse in the mouth? All right, let's talk about what this government is doing in the health space. So $1.9 billion additional investment across the health system. And what I'm particularly proud of are the investments in the mental health space, something, an area that is very important to me and that I spoke about in my first speech. Uh, this is, it includes a record $495 million increase for the Mental Health Commission. That is, as I say, a record increase and a significant amount of that commitment, $129.9 million, will go to youth mental health services and initiatives. And we know that when it comes to mental health, early intervention is critical, and it shows that this government is serious about getting on with the job. Uh, but the commitments to mental health don't just stop there with that funding for the Mental Health Commission, because as the Minister for Health has repeatedly outlined in this, pl in this place, uh, mental health presentations are an issue for the emergency departments as well. Mental health presentations at emergency departments are up by 11.4 per cent in the past three years. And that is why, and, and that those people are also spending longer in emergency departments. And that is why uh, there is an additional spend of $100 million, which includes extra beds in the mental health space. Um, and we, we, we've heard the member for Cottesloe and the leader of the opposition referring to the AMA. It's always good to hear members of the Liberal and National Party endorsing the position of a good union. Um, and, and I can say that I spoke, with, I spoke with a member of the AMA's council on Friday, and he said to me, you know what we really need? We need dedicated mental health facilities in our emergency departments. Lo and behold, member for Cottesloe, included in the $100 million spend on our emergency departments is a $61.6 million commitment for mental health construction in our two uh, mental health emergency centres at Rockingham and Armidale hospitals. It is an excellent announcement. Uh, dedicated mental health emergency department facilities have been working very well overseas in places like Toronto, and it is a credit to this government that it is pushing ahead with those facilities. This is a government making significant investments in health and in mental health. It is a government that is getting on with the job. It would just be nice if, for once, the Liberal Party would get on with its job and be a credible opposition in this place. Thank you, Member. Uh, the Member for Kimberley? Have I got that right? Yes. Delivers for regional West Australians. Yeah. For me, as a member for the Kimberley, I know and see firsthand the importance of quality health care and services. Since coming to this office, the government has made sure funding has been provided to regional WA to provide better services. This includes $7.98 million towards planning the development of the Broome Health and Wellbeing Campus. Uh, Nyambaburu Yaru project as part of the WA recovery plan. This is an exciting project that I will be watching closely. In the previous term of government, we funded and have delivered step up and step down community mental health facilities in Albany, Bunbury, Kalgoorlie and Geraldton. And the government continues to progress the delivery of further step up, step downs in Broome and Karatha, as well as new step up and step downs for Headland and a dedicated youth step up, step down. Additionally, additionally, the implementation of WA's first ever country ambulance strategy, which was released in November 2019, was by this Labor government, after the most extensive community consultations ever taken on country ambulance services. So far from the strategy, $9.2 million was committed to last October for three paid paramedics and six new ambulances in the Kimberley and funding to enhance access to care and patient flow for patients across all regional WA through improved patient coordination services. Plus announced this year a further $10 million boost for country ambulance services. This includes funding to recruit paid paramedics in nine regional locations to further strengthen country ambulances and provide better on the ground support for local volunteers. Recruitment is already underway for 25 additional paramedics to expand the current workforce workforce and support local volunteers. Yesterday I welcomed the incredible announcement by Minister Cook and Minister Dawson that in the upcoming state bu budget $1.9 billion will be invested in health and mental health across WA. 
Our regional communities will benefit from this massive boost. This includes $960 million for WA Health to address the unprecedented demand in the health system, that is 332 extra beds and more frontline staff in hospitals across the state. In addition, hundreds of millions of dollars to boost the capacity of health services around the state. A number of additional regional specific initiatives are being delivered, including commitments made at the 2021 election. As you know, Acting Speaker, the Kimberley is an extremely large and remote electorate, with a lot of people living in remote and rural locations and communities, not settlements. Um, here, here. Yeah, yeah. This Labor government knows. This Labor government knows that, and that's why they're funding different programs and schemes to create better access and regional and rural people to get the health care that they need. $19.7 million will be invested to expand the eligibility of the patient assisted travel scheme for patient support escorts for patients from vulnerable and disadvantaged groups, as well as maternity patients. I am pleased that this government will provide $10.9 million to the Royal Flying Doctor Service to refurbish and replace aircraft engines, making sure residents of the Kimberley can, take, can be taken to where they need in times of medical emergency. This is particularly um, sensitive for me. Just recently in the winter break, uh, I had an opportunity where my father's brother was suffered a heart attack in a remote community. and thank. Thankfully, due to the RFDS being flown out from that remote community to the town base and then down here to Royal Perth, he has survived that um, and is still recovering. Um, it is a long recovery process and my sisters, my cousins are here through the help of Pats to come down and make sure that he is supported through this process and he can come out the other side. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm also excited to see $2.8 million to expand women's, country, women's community health services in the Kimberley, which includes mental illness, family, domestic and sexual violence. This government is committed to responding to the mental health needs of all West Australians. This includes improving supports and services in the regions for people experiencing mental health, mental ill health or alcohol and other drugs issues, as well as their families, carers and support people. The new mental health services funded in the budget will make modern integrated care more accessible to people living in rem remote communities across the state. Um, I would like to acknowledge that also mentioned there was a concern for mental health of students that funding totaling $42.2 million for the employment of 100 full-time equivalent psychologists as well as additional supervising and lead psychologists over four years in public schools and a and a commiss whatever that word is, increase in funding for non-government schools is also a commitment by this government. Um, so, regional communities will, will benefit from the $31.7 million invested to expand statewide eating disorders and treatment programs. This is a reality, especially, um, I know this from my my daughter and her friends, her, her concerns for her friends who have shown signs of eating disorders. A comprehensive health and mental health package for regional WA will ensure all West Australians, no matter where you live, will have access to quality health care. Member for Matt Lawley. Thank you, Acting Speaker. It is a great privilege for me to stand and speak in opposition to this motion, but in particular to follow on from the member for Kimberley. Members, take note. If you want to learn how to represent a regional constituency, listen to what the member for Kimberley has to say. She can speak up with passion, commitment and alacrity on what it takes to represent a regional community. She is a testament to her community and to this chamber. Members, it is also a great privilege to follow the member for Coburn in his contribution. It struck me as well that this had the character of a Dorothy Dixer this uh, matter of public interest and it was it was incredibly surprising to see and his explanation the member for Coburn's explanation as to how it was that the member for Cottesloe arrived at presenting this motion for debate this afternoon seemed all too accurate and I just wonder whether or not it's it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly plausible it's a very it's a very plausible proposition but I suspect I suspect that we are coming towards the end of those times in which we'll be standing up to talk about health. It will be coming towards the end of those times when the state opposition continues to make the point that this government hasn't handled the health of Western Australians better than any previous government. And the reason I say that 
is, is for a couple of reasons. The reason I say that is because their arguments today were completely paradoxical. On the one hand, for example, we have the member for Cottesloe saying that this is a minister who doesn't listen to the workforce, but on the other hand, he has the ANF and the AMA on speed dial. On the one hand, we say that the, the Leader of the Opposition says, um, you know, this is too little too late, but we have a $1.9 billion investment. On the one hand, we have the member for Moore saying that he doesn't agree with Clive Palmer and that they're a safe pair of hands when it comes to public health messages such as vaccination. But not one of them, not one of them has stood up and publicly distanced themselves from their ideological bedfellows who are undermining public health in Australia. Ideological bedfellows like George Christensen, like Craig Kelly, like Barnaby Joyce, when, is, when, are these, when are these members opposite going to stand up and say, we don't agree with anything that they are saying, they are wrong and we are concerned with the public health of Western Australia? When are they going to apologise? When are they going to apologise? One of the fascinating things, one of the fascinating things that the member, that the member for, that the leader of the opposition raised, and I thought this was, you know, as a, as a dad with two young kids, this is an, an issue that's close to my heart, the investment in midwives. And I thought, what can we do as a state to encourage those perinatal and neonatal services, those birthing services, all, the, all, of, all of those important services that are critical to the state of Western Australia? And I know in the, in the, electorate, in the electorate of Mount Lawley, uh, most of my constituents have the great opportunity to access the, uh, um, the neonatal services and the obstetric, obstetric and gynaecological services at Osborne Park Hospital. And I know that there are incredible staff at King Eddie's Hospital as well, providing fantastic services to people across Western Australia. But That's what better time. could we Thank do you. than invest $1.8 billion in a new the women's question. and babies hospital? Thank you, Member. The question is that the question be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those to the contrary say no. Aye. The noes have it. The noes have it. Div division called. Ring the bells. Oh, sorry. He said no. He said division. Yeah, no. Um, he did say division. Yeah. Well, it was, yeah. <laughs> to catch all those at afternoon tea. <laughs> the long afternoon tea drink. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I appoint the member of Belmont as the teller to the nose and I appoint the member of Roe as the teller to the eyes. Before the tellers tell, I vote, cast my vote with the nose. All those in favour, please stand to be counted. Thank you. Please be seated. 
All those against, please stand to be counted. The results of the division, the eyes five, the nose 45. The nose have it, the nose have it. Honours <laughs> of the day.